Welcome to the 30 West IP studio. This is Mitch from 30 West IP. And this is Joe from 30 West IP. This webcast was recorded on 14 July 2020, so things may have changed if you are viewing this later. During this update, we will look at procedural changes to pilot's actions when Oceanic Air Traffic Control Services are unavailable, often referred to as ATC0. We will also share a simplified guide on these procedures that can be kept on an EFB. We will also update the suspension of the NAT data link mandate and look at two new NAT ops bulletins. Like our previous webcast, this webcast is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel for review later. We will take questions during the presentation, but we'll only answer them at the completion of the entire presentation. 30 West IP is committed to helping you meet your training requirements. Whether you prefer to attend our live instructor-led web-based interactive training or view our online e-learning course at your own pace, we have options available for you. We continue to invest in and evolve our content with updated professional graphics using two instructors and improved voice and video integration. Our goal is to create an immersive and interactive experience that you will enjoy. So just let us know how we can assist you. Now let's look at today's update. In the event that you have any problems, Joe will be assisting and available for questions at 817-296-1241. But remember, we're not technical experts, we're pilots. Due to the large number of attendees, this e-learning update will automatically mute all of your microphones. And while we don't do this during our webcast, it's essential to conducting this type of training. We will answer questions at the end of the presentation. We have a control panel that allows you to select questions and type them in. You can also, if you're on a pad, select a question mark. But during the conduct of the presentation, we'll refrain from interrupting. Imagine, if you will, that you've departed London Luton en route to Chicago DuPage. As you request your Oceanic clearance, you're informed the Gander is no longer accepting traffic and that you can expect a rather significant reroute. Your current route is 3,440 nautical miles. This isn't some far-fetched scenario. Many of you are familiar with this incident where transatlantic flights were not allowed to enter Gander because Gander had a smoke situation that required the evacuation of the center. They issued a notum and informed everyone of the situation, but for those of us that are already in the air and en route, that notum does very little good. The first time we hear about it is when we get a reroute. In this example, the reroute is 3,880 miles, 440 additional miles, which is quite significant. We actually know, folks, that we're out there during this period of time and had reroutes very, very similar to this. This is time to ask yourself some important questions. Do you have enough fuel on board to accept that reroute? Where will your new ETPs be located, and what will be the fuel remaining with those new ETPs? And most significantly, do you have a wet footprint? And obviously, you could be in a 550 or Global Express tankering fuel, and this might be well within your reach. But if you were in a Challenger 350 or a Challenger 650 or a Gulfstream 4, it might not. During our training, we like to refer to JEP FD. It's usually available to most of us readily in the cockpit. They have a section to, dedicated to ATM provisions for the NAT region, and they refer us in that section to the NAT Doc 006. NAT Doc 006, shown here, is providing us with a look at the contingency procedures associated with the loss of air traffic services in an oceanic region. A closer look at the contents reveals that this document is 145 pages long. Each flight information region has an individual variation of the plan. This is not readily available or useful to a pilot who might find himself in that situation. In March of this year, New York Oceanic was forced to temporarily close due to a controller testing positive for COVID-19. That affected the airspace in the Oceanic region as well as the domestic region. 
This led to the FAA re-examining and providing us with a much better resource than that Doc 006. Let's take a look at that now. A couple of weeks ago, the FAA published the SAFO regarding operations in oceanic airspace during the COVID-19 public health emergency. But do keep in mind that this SAFO applies to any time that air traffic control services may shut down, otherwise known as ATC zero situations. The recommended action that the FAA provides for us in this first page basically says to review the relative guidance from the AIP's NATDOC 006, Regional Supplement DOC 7030, etc. But they did include for us two pages of an appendix on this document, which includes contingency considerations for this ATC zero situation. The actions you take in an ATC zero situation really aren't much different from the actions you would take under a normal flight. You just have to be extra vigilant now about your separation from other aircraft because ATC isn't there to back you up. So the FAA emphasizes in the SAFO that you need to pay extra attention to your location, adhere to the current clearance as you received it, make sure you're accurately checking your course, you're plotting your course, uh, doing your 10 minute post checks as well, post position checks, and you're still encouraged to use slop as needed. These additional recommendations from Flight Standard Services coincide with the normal contingency procedures that you're familiar with from DOC 4444 or, or NATDOC 007. However, these are specific to the ATC zero situation, so you're not going to apply the full contingency procedure from those documents. But if you remember from, from our recurrent course or our, our initial course, if you've ever taken one from us, we give you a, a mnemonic to help remember the procedure. The mnemonic is MALT, M-A-L-T, Maintain, ACAST, Lights, and Talk. And that basically summarizes these three points. You should maintain your altitude. You should scan for other traffic using your ACAS or looking out the window visually. Light up your own aircraft and talk to the traffic around you on 121.5, 123.45, or 126.9 if you're in the IATA broadcast area procedures. The contingency considerations that Flight Standard Services puts out for us in the appendix of the SAFO address two possible scenarios. One, you're, you're in the airspace when ATC zero goes into effect, or you're approaching the airspace. You, you haven't gotten into it yet. So if you're already in the airspace when AT zero becomes effective, then you just stay on the clearance you had when you entered the airspace. Stay the course, so to speak. And then as you get close enough to the next FIR, when you're in communication range, you want to contact the ATC unit at the next active oceanic control area and give them an updated position report. In the next scenario, where you haven't yet entered the oceanic control area when ATC zero is enacted, you have two possibilities there. One is you have received the clearance already, or two, you have not received a clearance. Now, the easier situation would be if you have not received a clearance. In that case, uh, if you've not received a clearance or you've not entered the oceanic airspace, then simply don't enter the oceanic airspace. In fact, the FAA em emphasizes or encourages that you should land. In fact, go find an airport and land and then work out a plan from there. Now, the FAA does go on to state that if it's feasible, you could simply request a clearance to avoid the affected control area. But think back to the example that Mitch gave earlier. If you do this in-flight reroute, how are you going to be assured that you have enough fuel on board to cover the new ETPs? Uh, you won't even know what the wind is going to be like in that new control area to be able to effectively evaluate or quickly evaluate how much fuel you need. So don't put yourself into a situation where you might end up with wet footprint. It probably would be safer simply just to turn around, find an airport, land, work out an entirely new flight plan for that different route, uh, and then continue your flight. In the situation that you have already received an oceanic clearance, 
then it's up to you to decide whether you want to continue on that clearance or turn around and try something different. If you do continue on the clearance, just keep in mind that you're going to have very limited ATC services in that affected area. Now, even though you may have a clearance in hand for the affected control area, Flight Standard Services does state that if possible, you should consider seeking a new clearance to reroute around that affected control area. However, this does take you back to the considerations of how much fuel on board do you have and do you need to meet the new ETPs. And if you do decide to continue on your clearance into the affected ATC0 airspace, uh, then remember to continue broadcasting in the blind your position to other aircraft around you on uh, 121 decimal 5 or 123 decimal 45. Or if you're using the uh, IATA broadcast area procedures, you're going to be on 126 decimal 9. Be advised that air traffic control may invoke the ICAO traffic information broadcast by aircraft procedure. So if you don't do this regularly, uh, it might be a good idea to keep a copy of this paragraph available somewhere on your EFB for quick reference uh, to use this in the event that procedure is invoked during your ATC0 contingency. There are a few other additional considerations pointed out by Flight Standards Service in this SAFO. And the first one deals with level changes. And we want to clarify for you that what they mean by this is if you have received an ATC clearance for a level change prior to ATC zero going effective, then you are to execute that level change immediately. Uh, don't get distracted by the fact that ATC has failed or went to ATC zero condition. You execute that climb or descent immediately and you only do a level change if you were cleared by ATC. You don't conduct a level change simply because it was in your flight plan. Uh, so you, you just maintain the altitude you were at when ATC zero is effective unless you were given an, a level change from ATC prior to the ATC zero situation. Also, you're going to need to do mandatory position reports on HF or SAT voice uh, until otherwise told by ATC. Keep in mind, CPDLC is probably lost at this point, so you'll have to broadcast your position to other aircraft as well as to any other facility that might be able to hear you using HF or SAT voice. And with that in mind, you may need to use your flight dispatch office to give traffic information or uh, receive traffic information or forward position reports to the relevant oceanic control area if they're in a partial ATC zero condition. Uh, you may need to relay that data through your flight dispatch office as well. This document produced by NATS is a quick reference guide for you to use uh, in the event that you do encounter an ATC zero situation. This is their latest version. As you can see, it's 21 April of 2020, and it's available for you in the handouts section on the control panel or you can go to our website, 30westip.com, in the Resources tab under the North Atlantic area, and you can get a copy there as well. It'll be a PDF that you can download and keep on an EFB for quick reference. And now for a short update on the North Atlantic Data Link mandate. In review, the Data Link mandate boundaries are illustrated here in yellow on the North Atlantic orientation chart. The vertical boundaries are illustrated here, flight level 290 to flight level 410. The data link mandate shown in yellow is effective 24 hours a day, seven days a week without interruption. The magenta area illustrates tracks that are assigned PBCS standards. PBCS standards are designed to allow reduced separation in the North Atlantic are not related to the data link mandate. The PBCS mandate is a separate mandate. We show you here on JEPFD a particular day where all of the westbound tracks are PBCS tracks. In recent weeks, we've seen the track system typically showing one westbound track and one eastbound track a day. COVID-19 and the travel reduction associated with COVID-19 has created an entirely new situation. As a result, 
Each of the FIRs within the North Atlantic have issued notams stating that aircraft that are not data link equipped may continue to operate within those FIRs flight level 290 to 410 for a period up to 30 September 2020. In a previous webcast, we talked about this same suspension, but it was to 30 June 2020. They've extended it for 90 days, and we have no idea how long they're going to extend it after that. Reykjavik and Santa Maria notams are shown here. This is a regional plan being coordinated by the North Atlantic Systems Planning Group, and they've assigned a team to come up with the proper method of reintegrating the data link mandate across the North Atlantic region in a very organized fashion, and we'll keep you updated as we see this approach. Six days ago, on 8 July 2020, the North Atlantic issued two North Atlantic operations bulletins. The first bulletin is in regards to the surveillance service in the NAT region. Now, we've been talking for some time about space-based ADSB, Arion, in webcast and during the training, and this addresses the operation of space-based ADSB within the North Atlantic region. Within the North Atlantic, Reykjavik, Gander and Shanwick are utilizing space-based ADSB, and Santa Maria is using ADSB based on stations in the Azores. This has allowed them to extend ATS surveillance services well out into the North Atlantic region and completely cover Reykjavik, Gander, and Shanwick and parts of Santa Maria. This will mean that there's no interruption in your identification on surveillance, and therefore the practice of saying radar services terminate or surveillance services terminated will no longer occur. And they want us to be aware of this during this time. They want to go on and add that even if you are told that ATS surveillance services are terminated, that that isn't always going to be the case, that that just could be a response that's coming out of a familiar place for the controller that although not all the centers use it, it is used by many of the centers, as we mentioned before. In the flight procedures section, section 3, paragraph 3.3 is bold. And they've bolded this because this is a particularly important emphasis item. Regardless of whether or not ATC issues a termination, radar service is terminated, surveillance service is terminated, when direct controller to pilot VHF communication for the provision of ATS services is no longer being utilized, existing flight crew procedures continue to be required and remain unchanged while operating in the North Atlantic regional airspace. So let me paraphrase that. Anytime you're not in direct VHF communication in the North Atlantic, they want you to plot, do a 10-minute check, and continue to verify through all of your SOP procedures. They're emphasizing it in this bulletin. It's the primary purpose of the bulletin, and they put it in here in bold so that we can take this opportunity to suggest don't drop your guard. Use your checklist. Use your SOPs. The second bulletin isn't entirely new. It's a reissue of the Data Link Improvement Options Bulletin, and it's also effective on 8 July 20. 20. We haven't had a thorough look at this bulletin in any of our webcasts previously because it's rather lengthy and it's a wonderful read and it does offer some techniques, uh, but we're going to look at the change so that we can make sure we don't overlook what, what they're emphasizing in this moment. This is one of a series of different emphasis items and in this particular emphasis item, they're talking to the crew about disabling VHF communication prior to entering oceanic airspace to force the fan system to SATCOM use. And in doing so, they can eliminate a problem that has occurred with chatter in previous implementations. While some of the manufacturers 
of avionics have recommended this. This hasn't been universal, and this is just a recommendation. But if you do use this practice, they want to caution us that if we have to divert and we have lost SATCOM, then we want to go ahead and re-enable VHF to get ACARS communication as we coast in. We've already begun planning our next e-learning update. ICAO has issued an amendment to PANS ATM Doc 4444, and that'll be the subject of a September webcast. And in this update, we're looking at harmonized oceanic contingency procedures. We will see ICAO harmonize them, and, and we're hoping to see each of the regions employ them. We'll look at minor changes to SLOP, and we'll try to validate in the time remaining what the regions will do with this guidance because, as you're aware, the guidance from ICAO is uh, decided on by each region, and the Pacific currently hasn't adopted these. But uh, we're going to pay close attention to that, and in September we'll provide an additional update. Now, this concludes our webcast, and we're going to take questions in just a moment, but I want to remind you that you can reach out to Terry or you can reach out to myself and coordinate any kind of uh, training that you might be interested in the future or perhaps ideas about future webcasts. We look forward to hearing from you, and now let's go to Joe. So now I'm going to turn it over to Joe and let Joe ask you a question, and um, we'll rejoin you on um, the camera. And um, I hope Joe will as well. We have a quiz, a poll that we would like to um, ask you before we start going through the questions. And the poll is, have you ever encountered an oceanic reroute to an FIR closure? We thought that would be a real nice way of uh, taking what we just talked about to see how many people have ever encountered something like this. Because we know it occurred in both Gander and in New York, and, and that's just what we're familiar with. It could have been any different number of situations. Joe, are you able to join on audio? Well, we've got about, um, well, uh, I guess the best way to start this is right now we have 341 people on board and about 5% have said that they've had a reroute with 341. Mitch, people. are you hearing me at this point? I am, Joe. Thank you. I appreciate okay. it. Okay. I had to uh, reset my control panel. And uh, what I wanted to point out were for, to folks was the, the control on the answering the screen. If, you, if you're in full screen view, you may not be able to answer it. You may not be able to click and answer. So you might need to reduce it out of full screen view to answer Oh, it. thank you. I always forget to mention that. And Joe's uh, uh, actually better at this. So, well, okay, just, there, we got a few more people one pumping in. That was helpful, Joe. Um, all right, I'm gonna share that poll so you can see that. And uh, we had 6%. That's a pretty that's a pretty big number. That's about 25 people. Um, well, maybe about 20 people. So uh, that's that's pretty surprising. Uh, so yeah, this is yeah. a, a a very real thing. Now we don't have a lot of questions. I'm kind of surprised by that. We usually have a ton of questions. So Joe, why don't you start the questions? And okay. um, I'll bring this back around. Very good. Um, a couple of the questions I was able to answer using the text, but uh, the first question that we have came from Eldir. And he's asking, in the CPDC world that we're in now, if they're en route already in an oceanic control area, and then that FIR, that control area, goes into ATC zero, how will they notify the crew that they're in ATC zero? Is there a procedure in place? Um, I don't think that I know the answer to that, and I, I don't think that they can tell you. If, if I think what happened with... Um, 
with uh, Gander is that they did notify some people as they evacuated, but you know they only had a limited thing. And what really happened was that on the air to air frequency at 121.5, 123.45, everybody kind of got the gist. Um, I, I talked to a couple of people that got reroutes during that period, but I never talked to anybody that was in the center when it would uh, when it occurred. And one of the manifestations of it could be that you just simply don't have anybody to talk to. And of course, you always want to. Um, reach out to the people around you to see if that's in fact a lost comm or if it's, um, you know, cause you're not lost comm if you can talk to people around you. Joe, you have thoughts? Very good. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in compliance or an agreement of course, cause I, I haven't seen anything published stating that they're gonna issue some sort of a, you know, a blanket broadcast uh, before they leave the center. I haven't seen anything like that, but it would make sense. I mean, in, in the past, in my air traffic control experience, if we were gonna vacate, we would make a blank, you know, just a broadcast and then immediately leave. Uh, but, you know, there's no follow up to that. No way for you to call them back. OK, now uh, another question. Uh, Nicholas asks, uh, when do you expect a notum from the Oakland Center on the changes that you mentioned as far as the slop and the, the new procedures? Uh, I don't know. Um, what we've done is we have uh, talked to the FAA. And we know what their intent is, but um, we will follow up with them. We'll, we'll reach back out to them and try to get some additional information. We'll probably um, talk. We actually discussed whether it would be wise to introduce the new procedures now, and, and they suggested it would be better to wait closer to the time of implementation. So what, what we'll do is um, we'll keep that out. We'll keep that out there, and we'll let you know when we see something. Um, we're going to keep our eyes out on it. It will be closer to the time in which it occurs, I'm sure. And hopefully by the September webcast, we'll have that more information to, to share. And we did have a question on the UK um, little matrix, the chart, uh, and, and Joe had answered it, but I don't know if everybody got to see it. Uh, it is in the handout section. And it's also on our website under the resources tab. If you go to the North Atlantic, it's in there as well. Very good. Thank you, Mitch. Um, and yeah, it, it, all the information that we have on those handouts are available on our website 24-7. Uh, so if you ever need to go there and download them, feel free to do so. And you can put them on your EFB for quick reference later. Um, let's see. It says, uh, James is asking if we can explain why slop is important on random routes. Yes. Um, I'm a believer in slop. Slop's important on random routes, and it has to do with mathematical probabilities. Um, when you're up, and I, I realize I flew a Gulfstream and we would be at high altitude in the North Atlantic and there wouldn't be an airplane around us. All right, so I've, I've been in that situation. But you don't always see the airplanes that are 7,000 feet and lower behind, below you. And you um, don't always have a real good grasp of who's going to be coming left or right or converging straight ahead. Uh, your situational awareness is nowhere as good as ATCs. And often when you're on a random route, that's a route that a lot of other people use. It's not terribly random. And we see that if you follow um, some of the, like Flight Radar 24. Now, when GPS technology became part of an implementation for oceanic navigation, it increased risk. It placed aircraft with great accuracy right on top of each other. So to, to, to kind of give you an example, um, I flew a G2s and G3s when we were IRS only. And the fact that G2 was VLF Omega, and we would cross the North Atlantic at night and we would be at 410, which was, you know, top of the world then in that day and looking down at the traffic and we would be routing like everybody else because we were fairly limited on route structure. We didn't have a lot of gas and we would be on a route with a bunch of other people, basically a track above a track and we would be scattered left to right because of the inaccuracies, the drifting of the IRS, the drifting of the VLF Omega. So if if there were a big vertical event or a catastrophic event with an airplane, we were separated laterally by our navigational air. And in the 90s, when they started looking at implementing GPS navigation in oceanic airspace, it scared the mathematicians. They have a group of mathematicians that build mathematical probabilities of an air. And their thought was, oh my gosh, if you let these guys navigate with GPS, they'll be right on top of each other and they'll be extremely accurate. And then if something goes wrong, 
and they have uh, sudden abrupt clear air turbulence or um, wake turbulence from a heavy aircraft overhead or a catastrophic problem with an airplane, it will compromise their separation and actually literally compromise their safety. So they were very concerned about the implementation of GPS, which of course we all saw as an advantage for good reasons. It damaged the mathematical probability of safety. So they developed SLOP to manage that and, and to stagger us out there. And basically all SLOP did was it empl employed in a strategic manner the error that was already inherent in VLF Omega and IRSs. But we did it smartly. Everybody went right. So if you were headed straight at me and you had the wrong altitude and you were headed straight down the airway at me and I went right and or you went right, we would always deconflict. And the reason it's important on a random route is if everybody doesn't employ slop, it doesn't work. It, in order for this mathematical model to achieve the standards of safety, it has to work. So um, I'm not telling you that you have to employ slop. Slop is centerline right one or right two. And what the FAA recommends is that if you have the ability to, to offset, that you offset right one or right two. And if you don't, that you go centerline. And of course, now in the North Atlantic, as you're aware, it's tenths of a mile up to two miles. And that's what we're going to see change, we hope, in November uh, worldwide. Um, so if you don't employ it, and you think, well, I'm up here and there's nobody out here and somebody comes the wrong way or they're above you and they're or at the wrong altitude or they come cross uh, track, you know, north to south, you, you wouldn't see them until the last minute and it could create a real conflict. So it's important to everyone's safety to, um, and, and the FAA is pretty clear on that. Uh, that's a long-winded, that's a long-winded explanation, but let's just say that we believe in it and we're supporting it and we think it's an important emphasis item. Very good. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, Guy's pointing out for us that uh, Annex 11, Akeo Annex 11, uh, Attachment B, has the TIBA procedure that you mentioned, the one in use in Africa. So if folks are looking for that, that's where you can find it. And uh, he's, he's also mentioning that uh, uh, one way you can tell that uh, ATC0 has gone into effect is because it gets real quiet. So yeah. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. Thank you. And um, uh, that that IATB uh, procedure is also in the um, Jepson General Manual, and you know we rely on Jepson a lot. And um, if you go to the General Manual and you go to the Table of Contents, it's right there in the Table of Contents, and you can go right to it. It's in a bulletin, and it gives you that it, it, right there on your iPad. Everybody's got Jepson, so that's an, I don't have Annex. Well, actually, I do have Annex 11. I'm sure guys got Annex 11, um, but. Uh, most of you don't have Annex 11, and, and that's a good tool. Very good. Uh, one question just popped up, and it's relating to the slop again. So I'm going to go back to that, and then we'll get to the next question that Richard has. Um, uh, David's asking, if everyone is doing slop two miles right, then that's just going to stack everybody up again. But the idea, David, to remember is, is you need to take a look at the traffic that's immediately around you and decide what slop you want to employ. It's, it's not a given that everybody has to use one or two or tenths. It's available to you in tenths of a mile, uh, stated in Doc 4444. But the idea is that you're going to look around you, you'll look around at using your ACAS, your, your windows, and see what traffic is around you and separate yourselves using slop at your discretion. Uh, in oceanic airspace, remember when you coast out with time, but between the coast out and the coast in, you can use slop on your own. You don't have to have ATC clearance to do so. Uh, and so you don't the idea to, is that you're going to vary it and not everybody take right, the same. Right. You don't have to ask for permission. You can change it. You can be right point three and go right point eight or right 1.8 or come back based on what you see around you. And um, you don't have to ask permission or even tell anybody. You just respond to it as it as the dynamic situation changes. Good. Now, let um, me let me try some. Well, okay, go ahead, Joe. I was going to say, Richard's asking if if an oceanic center goes to ATZ zero and CPDLC services are discontinued, could the crew switch to A cars and communicate with Universal or AirRink via satellite? And yes. and I'll jump in on that if you don't mind, Richard. That is one of the things pointed out in the SAFO that you might need to to communicate via that method, or using HF frequencies themselves using your flight dispatch to relay messages if needed. Uh, use whatever means possible to see if you can communicate with that oceanic control area. But no, if they are in ATC zero, they may not respond. However, it's good to broadcast your position 
on the VHF as well as uh, try HF and see if you can reach the next FIR if you're close enough. Mitch, would you add anything to that? Um, yeah, we talk about something similar um, in the initial. Uh, there have been instances where crews down in the uh, oceanic sector off South America, and this is just an example, at night, and they can't get a hold of the center, let, let's say Picaro. Uh, so you're in Picaro, and you can't get a hold of Picaro at night, and it's kind of lonely out there, you know, you're bopping along. Um, call New York Air Inc. Uh, call the center ahead of you. Call your ops. Uh, get a hold of Universal. It's always good to talk to somebody. <laughs> You know, you don't want to be out there at night not talking to somebody. There's a large FIR off of Mexico that has no ATC management. That's really quite large. So let's say you took off from Acapulco and you headed to Tahiti. You'd be out there for some time. Call San Francisco Air Rink. Uh, be in contact with somebody in some way so that you can go back and forth. And, and it's actually pretty good to be hold of one of the um, ATC services. They cannot provide you ATC coverage. They'll tell you that but they realize the wisdom of talking, so they'll accept that. So that's a little bit more expansive discussion of that. All right, Mitch, thanks. Andrew's asking, does FlightAware 24 utilize space-based ADS-B? Is it a valid way to assist in deconfliction in the event of ATC zero? I would suggest it's not. They do use ADS-B if you have a certain subscription. They use space-based ADS-B. They're blue as opposed to yellow. But I, I look at that all the time. I've probably got 200 screenshots. Uh, I actually love Flight Radar 24. I got, and that's a very geeky thing to admit, to take all these screenshots. But I tell you what, I know doggone well, there's a lot more airplanes out there than they're showing. And anytime they show a yellow airplane, that airplane is not using ADS speed report positioning. It's using time. Like it, it went oceanic, they got the flight plan. So they're just having that move along the flight plan based on the time that it said it would be places. It's grossly inaccurate. And um, it's a wonderful tool, but for separation in an, an event of emergency, uh, essay-wise, it'd probably be nice, but I wouldn't count on it. It'd be really, really um, inaccurate for trying to be safe out in that airspace. Good, good essay, but probably not something you'd use to take a course of action. Okay, very good, thank you. And. Um... Let's see, the, this, this is a suggestion. Uh, Ed's asking is if, if we have time and anybody wants to volunteer to do it, has, if, if of the 6% who said they have had this ATC zero situation occur, are you willing to tell us about it? If you are, then uh, maybe type in and we'll unmute your microphone if you wanna tell us about it. Um, but in the meantime, while we're waiting on that, um, Let's see, a couple other questions. Guy is pointing out for us that, uh, you know, addressing the communication again, SATCOM voice to the next ATC might be a good way to, to reestablish communication if you're an ATC zero. And then uh, Jeff, uh, actually Steve wants to point out, and I think it's a good idea, Steve. Uh, you know, Steve says, think of the old pay more attention near VORs recommendation. Same thing applies at each 10 degrees of longitude. So, you know, pay attention to converging traffic on these common points. And, and yeah. what Steve's referring to about the VORs is, um, uh, when we were flying around the VOR infrastructure, uh, everybody flew over VORs before mm -hmm. RNAV. So every time you flew over a VOR, your probability of a loss of separation and your risk associated with it went up. So it was heads up around a VOR. And the same thing is true every time you pass an oceanic waypoint. It's the, those are defining points. So you, you want to be particularly careful. That's what that in air broadcast is about. Thank you, Steve. Excellent. Jeff asks or states as part of the ATC's uh, evacuation procedures, do they now have a portable sat phone available? This could provide another means of communication. Now, I, uh, well, I don't know well, that answer. Yeah. Who, who are you going to communicate with? You know, if they, if they evacuate the center, I mean, if they didn't evacuate the center, it might be helpful. Um, I would be very careful. The FAA is not in, at all uh, excited about people using portable sat phones to communicate in airplanes. Um, and I can tell you from inside knowledge that that has been a problem for a, for crews before. Uh, yeah. I think uh, Jeff's saying, what if ATC had a portable sat phone for them to use? 
Oh, and oh, okay. My problem. apologies. I apologize. Uh, yeah, yeah, that um, that might that might be helpful, but there's only so. Remember, there could be 200 airplanes out there. Uh, when you look at Flight Radar 24, you're not seeing all those airplanes. There's a lot more airplanes out there than that. So it depends on the density of traffic. Um, it, it could be that having you'd need a whole bunch of them. Uh, but that's it. That is a good idea. Sat voice. Uh, guy says sat voice to the next ATC, and that's a that's really a good idea. If you could, if you instead of trying to talk to somebody on the ground when there's nobody there, call to the next center like Gander Domestic or Shanwick or something, as in our scenario uh, that we talked about. Um, and then Guy also says all of the NAT target level of safety is based on slot being employed, and he's he's really on target there um, with that. Okay. Well, we haven't had anybody volunteer to speak about their experience with ATC Zero. I don't see anybody, uh, any hands raised or anybody uh, stating the question or, or the fact on the question bank. So, and that's all the questions that we've received at this point. I think uh, we I have just one more popped in. Remind me uh, on the Atlantic chart are the discrete ATC frequency and telephone numbers. And they're not on the North Atlantic chart with any accuracy what you'd want to do is go to your jep fd and and highlight the fir and there'll be a communication section in there and it'll give you sat phone numbers in the north atlantic it'll give you hf frequencies it'll give you vhf frequencies all right at your fingertips on jep fd it's one of the things we talk about in the um recurrent and joe there's one more yep uh just saw that one andrew was asking or maybe stating let me read through it why can't you continue into gander oceanic if they go into ATC zero, if you haven't received a clearance, could it not be the same as the normal procedure if you haven't received an oceanic clearance? You do not hold, you do not continue with the route you have filed and you keep, or you do continue with the route you have filed and keep trying for a clearance in normal circumstances. You continue into the airspace flying the route you have filed. Okay, let me go back and um, take a look at something here. Flight's not in receipt of an oceanic clearance. Is that your scenario? Um, I think it is. Why? He's asking, why can't you continue into Gander if you have not received a clearance? clearance? They prefer you land or get. Now, what, what are the terms there? Prefer, if feasible? They're not telling you you can't do it. They're just encouraging you not to do it. And I would encourage you not to do it. Um, the risk associated operating within that area without control, the risk of entering another sector after being in a sector without control. Um, you know, incidents involving loss of separation involve a lot of factors. I make a decision to enter Gander without a clearance and I just say, I'm just gonna follow my clearance. And then I, I proceed into the area and then something happens. I enter and I find that as I'm approaching Shanwick, that I'm encountering severe air turbulence and I need to change my altitude or my route. Or there's a thunderstorm and I need to change my altitude or my route. Or I have a, a loss of an engine. All these are improbable. I'll concede they're improbable, but that's why you don't wanna do this. Because when the improbable occurs, the, um, the, the compiling of different factors brings us to a point now where we've really created a risk that isn't easy to mitigate. Uh, Guy and I talked about this when we did a presentation last year at IOC. Uh, it's not always one thing that goes on. It's typically several things. Um, let me, uh, I hope that, Andrew, I hope that doesn't feel like I'm blowing you off. Um, and, 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 the, and I'm sure that the comment that I made about uh, slop is not going to be met with a lot of love either. Um, but it, these are coming from a place of, um, error management. These are coming from a place where we've seen these incidents, Guy and I have seen these incidents occur and, and have been part of discussions about, you know, oh, wow, if it hadn't been for this or if it hadn't been from that, that would have gone pretty well. Um, now, let me, I'm trying to find Guy on here. I want to kind of, um, if you'll just give me one second. We're, we, I think, Joe, aren't we um, basically done with everything? Well, I, we are, but I do that, see that Spencer Spencer Campbell has his hand up. Now, Spencer, is that you're putting up your hand in response to my previous question of 
people who want to share their experience with ATC Zero. In fact, I'll unmute your microphone, Spencer. Maybe. No, I cannot. Sorry. I unmuted your microphone, and Spencer, you're self-muted, so if you want to turn your mute off, you can um, ask a question if you like. Spencer, don't want to screen. I don't know if you can hear me or not. I can. I can hear you now. Okay. Sorry, guys. Yeah, didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, no, just enjoying, and uh, I was messing around with the screen trying to figure out uh, when you push the chat button, apparently to ask a question, didn't know that. So, <laughs> okay. Well, hey, now Spencer, let me ask you this. Um, yes, are you on an iPad or are you on a, a computer? iPhone, actually. iPhone. Um, yes, sir. Was, was the first portion of this presentation uh, basically really, really low volume? You know, I joined a couple minutes late, so I didn't notice any volume issues. Um, I don't know if that helps or not. Okay. If somebody wants to raise their hand and kind of talk about that with me, um, it would help me to know a little more about how that, what went down. We switched the audio platform and obviously it resolved it, but what we're trying to do is to avoid technical glitches. And as I usually say, when we start these things, um, you know, Joe and I are pilots. We're not technical people. We're not, you know, computer people. So we're always just trying to find the, the most rock solid way to do it. So, yeah, as far as questions go, that's those are the basically the only questions that we have left there. Um, and uh, Tim, you want to pipe up and help us out with how the audio went? Yeah, when I first started, uh, very, very low audio. I just went into settings, audio settings, and I switched uh, telephone back to mic speaker and then everything worked fine. OK, because I know we did have some problems. Um, anybody else? Uh, Kim? Uh, well, you're on the web. If you're on the web and not on the app, uh, we can't uh, we can't open your mic. There are a few uh, so people yeah. typing in on the questions saying, yes, low volume on the iPad. iPad volume was good for me. Uh, yes, it ended up stopping when you came back when you switched it. Another person writes, volume was a little low in the beginning, but not bad on my iPad. Another person writes, no audio issues on iPad. Another one writes, I have been on the iPhone from the start. Audio was normal the whole time. Okay. Um, well, let me, let me, as we conclude, we got 291 people still on board. Would you raise your hand if you had an audio problem in the beginning? That'll give us a real good look. Okay. And a lot of folks are still replying saying audio fine, audio fine, audio issues on iPhone in the beginning, volume had, was low on phone app, resolved after you switched. We had a lot of hands being raised here. So yeah. um, there were a lot of people that had a problem. Um, okay. And we see we don't always know if it's a, a a PC issue, a Mac issue, or an iPad issue. I'm on a Mac, or I'm on an iPad right now, and it was low on mine. It was barely audible on mine. So, but you got to take into account that I got uh, three computers running at this desk. So, I'm I'm pretty much just constantly in a state of confusion that's being managed. Well, well, I appreciate all the feedback, guys. Thank you guys for giving us a technical uh, feedback here. Um, Mitch, I, I'm not seeing any other questions. It's it's mostly everyone responding right now to the audio. Um, and it's a, it seems to be kind of a split thing. PC, everybody said fine on PC. Everyone who's on a PC is saying they had fine. Oh, okay. no, one person just said audio seemed muted in the beginning, then it fixed. Okay. So and that was a PC laptop. Well, we want to thank you um for attending oh, we do have another question ah, for okay. slop on a random route what technique do you recommend to make it truly random geez um i've heard people say they flip a coin uh, i've heard people say they have like uh, if they're eastbound they do one if they're westbound they do two um you know i don't i don't have a solid recommendation on that because it's based on situational awareness uh, you know, if I traditionally were to offset one, now I could do 0.5 or 1.5 in the North Atlantic. So I've got more variables, uh, just something that would be different. And um, and do again, it, pay attention to what's immediately around you and, and base your situation on that. Thank you, Joe. That's very important. That's the most important thing right there. The people, you, the, the people that you can see. We want to thank you. Uh, keep us in mind if you decide that you're going to do some training. Um, <laughs> Sorry. We, we love to do training. John and, made uh, me laugh. He says, use a slop generator app. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. My apologies. Yeah, they, got, they got an app for that. I'm sure they got an app for that. <laughs> and, uh, 
so we're going to sign off and um, we'll see you hopefully hear from you soon or at the next uh, webcast. And we did get a suggestion about a webcast. and We always appreciate those and you can reach out to us directly. So thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Be safe out there.